Live from the Panera Studios, it's the Reading with Robin show, brought to you each week by my friends at Panera Bread, where their Pink Ribbon Bagel campaign just started to support Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You can support local breast cancer charities just by purchasing a Pink Ribbon Bagel throughout October. So go to your local Panera Bread and support this amazing campaign with a Pink Ribbon Bagel all throughout October. Panera is my favorite place to stop by for a cup of coffee, hang out with friends, and it's a great place for book clubs to meet. It's all at Panera Bread. And now, enjoy the show. Brand new and out today, Kerry Egan's On Living, this incredibly awesome book, this small, deceivingly small package with a huge, huge punch. I picked up On Living whenever it arrived, and I sat down with it, and I did not get up until I was finished. It's that kind of book. Not what I expected at all, and immediately went back and forth with Kerry to share my overwhelming I don't know, joy at finding a book this impactful. And she's on the phone. The book is out today. It's called On Living. Kerry Egan is a hospice chaplain and a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Her essays have appeared in Parents, American Baby, Reader's Digest, and on CNN.com, among other places. She and her family live in South Carolina, and I am thrilled to have her on Reading with Robin on Pub Day. Welcome to Reading with Robin, Carrie. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Well, we are old friends now. Carrie and I have officially been on the phone for a very long time, <laughs> and now we're letting everybody in on our on our discussion because really, it's been going on re- for an hour now. <laughs> we're, right? We're just going on and on. We're doing a marathon, marathon with Carrie Egan. I should also say this book is out by Riverhead Books, and people that listen to Reading with Robin know what I think about that amazing imprint. Visit Carrie at CarrieEgan dot com. You can find her on Facebook and on Twitter. And we have a very strong Rhode Island connection as well. So talk a little bit about, because I don't know if people know, and I certainly didn't fully understand what the role of a hospice chaplain is. Well, I had been a a hospital chaplain before, but the first place I ever Ah. worked as a hospice chaplain was in Providence at Home and Hospice Care of Rhode Island up on North Main Street. And they're still there. They're yeah. one of the oldest hospices. Yeah, they're the second oldest hospice in the U.S. Um, I Did think they not know their that. name now. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're very proud of that. They should be very sure. proud of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the second oldest hospice um, in America was, was in Providence, which is pretty cool. Um, really cool. I like any distinction that we can have here in Rhode Island. <laughs> That's a positive one. We'll take. Because they just, I mean, it's uh, anybody that has ever been involved in any way with hospice knows the work that is done and the heart and the love and the, I mean, you really have to be somebody special to be there. So I think, you know, that's really a nice distinction to have well, here it, in Rhode yeah, Island. I, it is. It, no, it really is. And it, it was, um, it's an amazing organization. It's truly an amazing organization. Um, but um, I always feel like with hospice, you know, people say, oh, you must be really special. No, actually, no, not at all. <laughs> Um, I actually feel like working in hospice is either something you can do or it's something that you, you really can't do and you'll quit within six weeks. Like it, it's not really the kind of thing, like if I'm just strong enough, I can gut it out. Like mm-hmm. either it's very doable for you or, or it's not. So it's nothing really, there's nothing people who do it. I mean, I love people who work in hospice, but we're not really special or particularly strong or any of those things. It's, it's like just I something be, that's in, in, in you to do. So yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's well, I don't really like, like when people say, you know, somebody's so strong when you're going through something. Sometimes that verbiage of you're so strong, it's like, well, you can either do it. It is sort of inside of you or not. So I sort of I get what you're saying. Yeah. Like, I could not be a middle school teacher yeah. at all. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Well, that is a whole other level of being I strong. I can only I imagine. Like, I see packs of 13-year-old girls walking down the street, and I still, like, Cross the other side. Like, I'm still frightened. I'm still frightened of a 13 year old girl. Well, they're still a scary group. That's, there's, a, there's a good reason to be afraid of the 13 year old girl pack. So that so, makes good, you show good sense. So, right, everybody has something their that's strength. Been really easy for them. Something that they wouldn't say, oh, I'm so strong there with you. No, it's just it's something I can just do. I'm doing it because I can do it. And that's, I don't know, that sort of sums it up for me. 
very. So I didn't when plan, did you, I didn't, I didn't you plan, plan to become a hospice chaplain. I um, I was a religion major as an undergrad, um, only because we had to take a required class, and I took a required, and I loved it. I loved that religion class, and then I decided I wanted to get a PhD in um, American religion and sort of looking at lived religion, like what, what does religion mean to people? Not, you know, like theology. Um, mm-hmm but like in practice, like in their everyday lives. Um, and then when I got to Harvard Divinity School, I did a field ed placement um, after my dad died. My dad died my first year there. And I oh, decided to do a field ed placement um, at Dana-Farber Cancer Hospital up in mm-hmm. Boston. And, um, and I realized then that um, I wanted to study lived religion, but here was this job, this whole profession that really was like not studying lived religion, but like sitting down with people at some of the scariest moments of their lives and like figuring out what religion meant to them. Like, what do you believe and how do those beliefs actually play out in the course of real life? So, you know, I had sort of gone from thinking I wanted to study it in books to thinking, Oh my gosh, you don't need to study in a book. You can actually sit with real people in real time and help them figure out, you know, what is it, what is it they believe and how are those beliefs helping them get through this really hard time or not helping them get through this really hard time. Um, so then I decided that was when I decided I wanted to be a chaplain and I was a hospital chaplain and I did training for a hospital chaplain. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was only after my kids were born that um, I decided to tentatively go back to work. I had a really hard time uh, when my son was born and about that sure yeah (laughs) and um I didn't know if I'd ever go back to work to tell you the truth I didn't know if I could I and and I applied for this job as a hospice chaplain um honestly just like to have practice applying for a job I didn't I didn't think I'd get I'd get called back and I didn't right away Mm -hmm. yeah I actually didn't right away and I was like relieved I replied in February and I didn't hear anything and I thought oh thank god uh, Half <laughs> right. that one. They don't need yeah. to hear. Yeah. I, I can say I applied, but nothing happened. And then that next summer, they called and they said, hey, we had your application and we hired someone else, but we kept your resume mm-hmm. and we have another opening now. Do you want to come in for an interview? Um, and I sort of went into the interview again thinking, this is just practice. I'm not really going to take this job. I'm just going to practice, you know, I'm dipping my toe in the water. Sure. And then I met I met them, and it was this incredible group of chaplains, um, I mean, they were just wonderful. Hospice cha- the best part of working in hospice is that you get to work with other people in hospice. <laughs> like, they're just great. They're just great people. Yeah, um, but not special. Often, <laughs> but not special. Just, like, really, <laughs> like really down to earth and, and fun and sensitive and thoughtful and just, just great people. Um, and so I decided, um, well, maybe I'll try it. I'll try. I'll try giving back. And then and I never looked back. Um, I just love the way a story takes hold, even starting with taking a class that's required or to fill a requirement. And that's yeah. one of the things that when you know when you tell your children when they're going to school and they're looking at what they want to take, you just don't know where it's going to fit one day or to just take things that seem like they might be interesting. But to fulfill a requirement and then have it be your life's work and the way you're describing your path is, um, you know, you're such a great storyteller, and that really comes shining through also in On Living. And I'm speaking with Kerry Egan. You can visit her site at kerryegan.com. You can find her on Facebook and on Twitter. And this wonderful review from Refinery29, I love the Refinery29 site, equal parts memoir and meditative text on the nature of life and the many faces of faith. Egan's book brought me to tears and then back again. If you have ever experienced loss, and even if you haven't, this beautiful book will speak to parts of your heart that you didn't even realize were hurting. What's more, it might help heal them. And there and I think I posted this on the Reading with Robin page on Facebook, just talking about how much this book means to me, meant to me, well, and it's the kind of book that you'll revisit. It's dog-eared and it's revisitable and meaningful in so many ways and surprising ways. And I think in reading it, I caught myself repeating, you know, going back and flipping back and thinking about the stories and the people that you talk about and connecting with them in different ways. It really resonates. And it's a book for everybody, you know, so I love that, that your readership is everybody. <laughs> oh, really, thank you. really good. You're welcome. That, that means a lot to me because, you know, I, I wrote the book um, 
because basically because a patient asked me to. <laughs> I have this wonderful patient. She's, oh. she's Gloria, the one who starts the book. Yeah. And um, she said to me, um, she said, you know, I always wish I could meet someone, a writer. And I would just give him my story, and I would say, oh. here, take them and write them down. He's like, you know, I will, because I never, I never figured it out. Here I am, I'm, I'm getting ready to die, and I feel like I never figured out life. And maybe if someone else could read my story, it could help them because, you know, God knows it didn't help me. Hmm. And she said, but I never met a writer. And, you know, I was there as a chaplain. I wasn't there as a writer. You know, I had written a book, a first book. You know, yes, years you and that years. was, yes, also in the bio, right, I know. Yeah, it and it was meant, yeah. um, before my son was born. I got very sick after my son was born. Um, and so I never thought I'd be a writer again either. I really didn't think I'd ever write another book again. And um, she's sitting there and she's like, I would just, she had like this imagination of like what the writer would be like. And she would meet the writer and he would say, this needs to be a book. People need to learn from you. And, wow. and she said, I never met a writer. And she said, and oh. we're just sitting there silently. And I don't so what do you say? Yeah. You're, what are you right, deciding I, what to share? I've never met right. a writer. Hmm. Because you're not, I'm not, number one, I'm not there as a writer, right? I'm not there to collect stories. I'm there to be her chaplain. as a very specific role. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, you know, how much do you share of your own life? Because it's not about me, right? It's about her. Sure. So I don't say anything at first. And then she's going on and on. And then she goes, you know, I used to pray and pray. And pray. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I guess God just doesn't answer some prayers. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I, you must and have. And I thought, okay, now I, just, I need to, so finally I said, you know, did I ever tell you I used to be a writer? And she, she's a Southern wow. Baptist. She's so cute. And she does. She doesn't look at me. She looks straight up to the ceiling and she goes, Jesus, I thought you were going to send me a man. <laughs> she looks at me and she goes, I thought you were going to be a man, Terry. But this is it. I can tell, like, the Holy Spirit sent me. And, wow. and she made me promise. She said, pro- she said, you are, she was so funny. She's like, you already know my stories. Now it's easy. It's easy. You just got to write them down. Well, she gave it all to you right. Now the easy part comes. You just yeah. need to write them down. And she said, um, promise me you will. And there's a lot of other stories besides her story, obviously, in the book. But, but yeah. she did. She said, promise me, promise me you will write a book and you will tell other people my stories. And and there's a oh, lot wow. of people I met. Not everybody. You know, a lot of people will tell the chaplain, you know, their life story and they struggle to make sense of it. You know, what did these things that happened to me mean? Like, how do I, how do I make sense of it as I'm ending my life? And not everybody, not many people, but enough people would say, you know, I really want, I want more people to know my story. Um, and so then I, you know, at that point I would say, you know, if I ever wrote another book, if I ever wrote about this, could I tell your story? And more people than I ever would have thought said, you know, yes, that's what they would want, that, the, that they wanted that. Um, and those are the people in the book. So, so for you to say that, you know, the book really resonated and you're, it's dog-eared and you're going to go back, like, yeah, you it's, should it's see making, what this book looks me, like. Yeah, but it's making me like it's making me happy because I feel like I um I feel like I fulfilled my promise at, at least a little bit like at least for one person for well, you to say that it means like uh, for what, I I fulfilled that promise. Um, well, so that, Gloria would be very proud of this. I I just think that that hearing and reading that I got chills just reading that and and cannot even imagine what that must feel like as you were you know you know your role there you know what what you're there to do and and what the relationship is and the respect and all of that. And, and, you know, and you know, I didn't finally it's it. kind of like, okay, I'm a writer, you know, but, yeah, um, and I, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't write about it for a long time, I, but I had a piece of paper, like a piece of typing paper and I wrote out above it, like you promised Gloria, that's not her real name, all the names were changed, but sure, you promised Gloria that you would tell her stories. And I actually, I like, I pinned it up in my, in my room because I felt like I needed the reminder, but I also, you know, at the time I didn't know what that would look like or how that would happen. Um, but I knew I had this, you know, this obligation. Um, and so that's really, it means a lot to me to hear you say that. Well, I'm so excited, and it's out today. It's called On Living, out by Riverhead Books, and it is by Kerry Egan. And this is one of those books that people, I mean, I love to buy books for, for people, and I was actually just telling somebody about this book when I was 
paying condolence call and not because that this is book is for everybody it's for you know i know that people will think that they should give this to somebody that's going through something particularly hard but life is particularly hard <laughs> so it's yeah. there is meaning on every single page and in every story they're so tightly told and i always say like no wasted footage and the yeah there's there's so much i mean listening to people's stories and people want to be heard it's fascinating the way we can connect with somebody that you might think there's very little on the surface in common with until they start telling their stories. One of the things that is most fascinating to me, and I would think as one is contemplating the end of life, are the secrets. You know, And, and can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about um, the secrets people keep and, and if they want to offer them up at any level or how you talk to somebody about um, having them express a secret in a way that's comfortable maybe for them. So, you know, as a chaplain, you go in there and uh, you only visit someone basically if they ask to see the chaplain, right? Mm-hmm. So in hospice, you know, the nurse goes in no matter what, the social worker goes in no matter what. The chaplain goes in if you request the chaplain or, you know, during the admission visit, you know, the nurse will say, do you want to see the chaplain? So when you go in as a chaplain, you know, my role, any, any chaplain's role is to meet the spiritual needs of the patient. But when you go in, you don't necessarily know what that is, right? You actually, it's not necessarily. You don't know what that is. Sure. You don't know what that is. Um, and so you don't. You go in and you just kind of sit down and you sort of explain your role, um, and then you have to wait. You have to wait and see what is it this person wants to talk about. And sometimes people who have been through really hard, difficult, traumatic things in their lives, and, and I've heard, you know, I've heard stories. Um, you know, people who have, you know, been raped by their father, by, you know, people who have murdered someone, people whose, you know, parent was murdered in front of their eyes. I mean, really awful things that yeah. people have gone through in life, and they don't necessarily bring it up right away, right? They have to know that you're a trustworthy – some people do. Some people are so desperate to just get it off their chest and talk about it. Sure. That, you know, they'll start talking at the first visit. Um Hmm. For a lot of people, that takes a long time. And so sometimes people don't tell that secret for a long time. And, you know, and there are people you meet with who sort of hint at something that happened in their lives, and they never open up. They never tell it. Um, so you, you would never ask someone, you know, what are your secrets? You, first, you, you have to wait for them to come to that place to decide that this is what they need to talk about, right? The patient decides what we talk about on a given day, right? I don't go in and and shut sure. the agenda. They do. But when someone is getting ready to sort of tell you a, a, some, a secret or, or, you know, something really hard they've been through, um, you can usually sort of feel it. There's like a change in the air. Um, and it's really hard. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of, there's a lot of respect and a lot of awe to tell you the truth for my patients to have been able to, at a time when they're not feeling well physically, right? I mean, yeah, right, people course. who are dying feel awful for the most part. Not always, but usually and then to really do this really hard spiritual work and that's what it is this mm-hmm. we talk about spiritual what i mean by that is like this work of making meaning like what do things mean um that i have a lot of awe and a lot of respect for those patients i really do well and and to be sort of in their space and that is you know such a huge honor responsibility all of that holy really right so i i can only imagine and do you notice the feeling or the the connection that they felt from telling you what they needed to say or you know contem- even seeing the contemplation of what they're considering sharing yeah you usually can it's usually um they kind of they kind of look at you they kind of check you out they're kind of looking to see like can i trust this person is this like a safe place to do this? Um, am I, am I going to be able to talk about this and not, even if I, if I fall apart, am I going to be able to get put back together? Am I going to be able to pull myself back together? Because sometimes, you know, when you walk around with these secrets or these traumas, these losses for a long time, you begin to think like, I can never even talk about it. I mean, I think we've all had that experience, right? It's something so difficult. Right. You just can't even talk about it. And so you sort of carry it around and you don't, you don't realize how much emotional energy it takes to carry around until, until you finally work up the courage to say it. And, and like, don't ever miss, you know, miss it or underestimate how hard that is to work up that courage. Because in the moment, it's not really all that clear 
that you're going to be able to figure it out, that you're going to be able to make meaning of it, that you're not going to be able to, to just, you know, you're not going to disintegrate into dust. Um, and I think that's where the chaplain is really so helpful because, you know, she's been with other people who have done this. She is not going to let you fall. You know, she's not going to let you be destroyed. She knows you won't be destroyed, right? She knows yeah. you're not, you're going to be okay that you, I guess that's what I love about being a chaplain. <laughs> like people always say like, isn't it depressing? And it's sad. It's sad when someone you love dies. And even if you're the chaplain and you've only known this person for six months, and it's still sad. There's, there's sad. So, yeah, of course there's sad aspects of the job. But what I love about it um, is that it gives me so much courage, you know, to deal with my own hard things. Because I've seen so many people who really don't think they can, even at the end of their lives, sort of, do this meaning-making work of making sense. You know, what did all this all mean? Why did this happen? To see that it gets done over and over and over. You know, it doesn't just happen once or twice. It's not, it's, it's not an, a rare thing that it happens, um, but it feels miraculous every time. It really does. Well, you could tell um, how much you, you love your job, and that comes shining through. And also in your picture, people can go to uh, on Facebook to your Carrie Egan page, and also com and on your book. You could just do the sort of a, the, the light shining out of this picture. It's great. Um, did the photography. It's really beautiful. And the, I don't know, just the reverence that you give to the space with your patients. I mean, is there, I, I know there, it's also a job, so there's a t- sense of time, but is it ever just impossible to leave where you're talking to somebody or sort of how do you space out your visits, because I have to think that sometimes you're just like, I can't leave right now. This happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're in a position where um, someone has sort of just opened up and is really, really working hard and struggling at that meaning-making work, you know, and has just sort of told you this terrible secret, you can't be like, Okay, time's up. Got to go. Right. Yeah, i got to leave in four minutes because I've got another <laughs> – I've got another appointment. <laughs> right. Can you wrap up this revelation? It's time to go. Right. Can you be can you be more concise? Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying you know, so you then you just you have to just alter the rest of the day however you manage yeah. it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, there have been days where I have spent the entire day with one patient. Sure. Now that's rare. That's not typical. That's pretty rare. Right. But yeah, that has certainly happened. That is very much yes. Well, and also, and I can, I mean, also thinking about speaking to somebody at the end of their life and the secrets that that they needed to hold on to or that they didn't think they could share or even acknowledge that it was there. What's the takeaway in On Living, and it's out today by Kerry Egan, about ways to manage to not get to that point. I mean, to live without regret, I understand, is probably, you know, an ideal, and I don't know, worth striving for or whatever. But what are some things that you would suggest for people on a daily basis so that it's kind of like easier to clean up at the end if you keep needing things neat all the time? <laughs> sort of how to, yeah. how to get like to the end there without so much to kind of put away. How, I like, guess when, like when you're, yeah, like when you're cooking, like clean as, my sister is a pastry chef. Exactly. So she's She's always saying, like, you clean as you cook. Clean as you cook. Otherwise. <laughs> exactly. So how would you suggest cleaning as you cook up your life <laughs> before you're cooked, you know? So one of the things, there's a couple of things I've learned from, and that's kind of what I've learned from my patients. Like, you don't need to do, any of us can do these things. Like, you don't need to be dying to sort of make meaning out of what you're going through in your life, right? It's not, it's not like a special activity just for people who are dying. If, if anything, like you have more energy exactly. this to is do it now. On, on living, exactly. Do it when you have the, the space or to, to make the space for it. And I think that's a huge takeaway. And it would seem to me that patients of yours that want their stories told would want somebody to learn from that, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, that's what they would say. So, right. I mean, I would say in terms of like, you know, like those, like shame, shame is such a big thing, huge, mm-hmm. that comes up with patients. They're, they're ashamed of the things they've been through. They're ashamed of the things they did or that um, were done to them, much more so things that were done to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they feel they, they carry this shame around. Um, and I think, what, I think what I would want people to know about that is that shame, and sometimes, you know, people will, they'll carry around the shame and they'll, they'll keep these secrets because they think it's the loving thing to do. That's why they do it. 
I really believe that. People think that carrying around the shame or keeping a secret is an act of love. But in my experience, it's, it's not. But shame, like, is never, it's never going to be in the service of love. That if you're ashamed of something, you're carrying around the shame. Or you're making someone feel ashamed, right? We do that as a culture, right? Sure. We, yeah. we try well, to control absolutely. people by, and we're trying to save them from being hurt. If I shame you, you know, into X, Y, and Z, you won't get hurt by doing whatever. That it never works. So that would be number exactly. one. The number one big thing I want people to know. Shame is like the enemy of love. It, if you have the impulse to shame someone, like fight Don't. it. It's right. not helpful. It's exactly. not going to work. Yeah, um, shame. Another Shame's one I would say one. about about regrets is that um, if there's something you really, really deeply regret, if you can, and you can, I know you can. I know you can because my patients can. Like really examine that regret. Really examine that thing and look at it with the lens of what do I wish had been different? Like, what is this regret? Why do I regret this? What do I wish had been different? What is my hope? What do I, what do I, and that, whatever you wish was different is your hope. That's what you hope for. And you can go ahead and try to make that come true, right? It's a way to try to acknowledge what is it I really want. I regret X, Y, and Z. But that shows me that what I really want in life is this. And then you still have time to go get it. You still have time to do it. You still have time to be it. Um, Those are some pretty huge takeaways. And I'm speaking with Carrie Egan. She's the author of On Living. It's out today. Carrie is a hospice chaplain and did much of her work where I happen to live in Rhode Island. So we are, Carrie and I, clearly connected in many ways. Long Island, Rhode Island. (laughs) <laughs> writers, books, all of it, and um, and and uh, the book is out today, and you can visit her site at kerryegan.com and Facebook and on Twitter. Those are some really huge regrets, shame, the things that, that you sort of, that are in, in your head, the things that you want to make sense of, but sort of like your sister, the the baker, keeping them neat as you sort of go along. It sounds yeah. like a lofty goal, but I think the books that resonate with me so much are the ones that make me really think and take action. Small action can be fine, but, but something. And this book makes me want to do something or do, you know, really think about things and, and um, examine them more closely. And the stories are told, like I said, with, you know, just so, you're just such a beautiful writer. And, oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And also thinking about, what it was like for you to be with each of your patients and telling their story and weaving yours through it. The one about ordinary angels, that, that chapter, I think yeah. particularly dog-eared because, I don't know, there are some things, before I let you go, because I know I have to let you go soon, how do you explain the inexplicable? And when people say, you know, just sort of really believe something's happened and are told, you know, well, they're, you know, it's explained away by, I think you say, science or meteorology or whatever it is. Because that story about the the, butter, the sisters with the butterflies, that I know, isn't that crazy? Chilling. But I, yes. I, I, absol- I absolutely believe boxes. that. And, you know, and that's like just one of them. I mean, people come up to me all the time. Um, like I, I know a woman who came up and who said to me, you know, my mom died when I was really young and, and she loved butterflies, or not butterflies, ladybugs. And she sort of died this really difficult death. And, and she said, you know, don't worry, you know, whenever you're, whenever you need me, I'll be there with you. And she's like, and I see ladybugs. She goes, and, and at first, you know, they were, you know, I only noticed the actual ladybugs. She's like, but then I began to notice like a ladybug poster. She's like, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and so the question becomes, is that coincidence? Are you looking for what you want? Or, you know, that person has found really deep significance in that. And I feel like sometimes we have this desire to, like, take it away. Like, we want to take away someone's ability <laughs> or desire to, like, find some sort of deeper meaning. And I'm not sure why we sort of have that. Um, but it's a mean thing to do. It's really I mean. It is mean if somebody is really connected in that way to something and it's bringing them peace or joy or hope. I mean, hope is yeah. a really horrible thing to ever dash because of our own feelings, prejudice, fears, whatever, you know, or what we, we've been taught um, and how that might fight against our belief system. But how, how would one take something like that away? I just think the, these things that happen that are meaningful and that happen inexplicably but repeatedly, whether it's 
smelling a perfume, hearing a song mm-hmm. at the right time, or the smell all the, I hear that all the time. So like you, I smell, you, yeah. So I smell my mom's perfume, or I always smell roses. Like I, mm-hmm. yes, that is a big one. The smell, and you know what I would say to people is, it, sometimes people will say like, oh my goodness, people who work in hospice would really love this book. And I, and I always think, you know, I, I think they would. I think they'd really like it. But I also think it would be nothing new to them because they have had these experiences too. Like anybody who's worked in hospice long enough, mm-hmm. <laughs> these are not crazy experiences that I had alone. Like people, this is pretty par for the course. But there are going to be these things that are hard to explain. And so what do I do with it now? You know, what I do is I say to people, well, what do you think it means? You know, I'm not interested in whether or not, you know, it's scientifically possible. I want right. to know, because that's my job as a chaplain, what is the meaning you find in this now? Because that's, that's my role. I'm not a scientist. I want to know what, how do you make meaning of this crazy experience? Because um, ultimately what else really matters but how we interpret something or internalize it and brings us peace or it only really matters what we think. Because really, I mean, what else really does matter to me, anyway? Um, so if that sign or that circumstance brings that, you know, makes somebody feel like they're not alone, the energy is around them, then it is right. And like, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want someone doing surgery on me based on like their feelings. <laughs> <right now. laughs> no, there you'd I'm want all, a little so more science, science involved right. in the surgery. Yeah, like I am. Totally pro science. I am pro medicine. I am pro all of those things. But there, there remain these outliers. You know, um, people yeah, who are dying. Not all black and their, white, right? Yeah, people who are dying see their mothers mm-hmm. all the time. Their mothers who've already passed away. Ask anybody. Yes. This is like in no way is this shocking or new. This is like com- pretty common knowledge at this point. You know, and if someone who's dying, are they are they hallucinating? Are they really? Is their mother coming back from? the other side you know what what i don't i can't answer that and maybe someday science will i'm not a scientist my question at the moment is is that if the patient if the patient is aware and is able to say my mother Stephen visited me last night at the foot of the bed you know i'll say what was that experience like was that and what do they say what do you hear often oh it's never scary it's like wonderful like wonderful like i'm so happy to see her um my favorite, my, one of my favorite things that ever happened to me was this woman who um, kept seeing a young woman at the foot of the bed um, with her mother, and the two women were holding hands and waving at her, and she didn't know who this strange young woman was, and it really bothered her, and we talked about that. She was like, why, who, who is visiting me, <laughs> and why don't yeah. I know who she is? And it was really causing a lot of distress. And that's like when the nurse calls. You know, the nurse is like, you know, medically, I can't, I don't know what to say about this. This is not my purview, right? Yeah. And I don't, I don't try to do nursing. Um, and I think that's important to say, you know, like, I'm, I'm pro-nursing, pro-medicine, I, you know. But there are these things where, like, the chap, that's what I do, you know. Like, what does it mean that there's a strange woman at the foot of my bed as I'm dying? I don't know who she is. And what she figured out um, she ended up looking through some old photograph, photo albums with her daughter. And as she was going through, she saw a picture of her birth mother in her wedding dress. And it was the only picture she had of her birth mother. Wow. And her, mother died in, her mother died in childbirth. And so she was raised by her stepmother. And she realized it was her, technically her stepmother, who was really, her, you know, felt like her mother to her. Right. It was her stepmother and her birth mother holding hands. Oh. I could get like weepy thinking about this, wow. waving to her, like waiting for her, like we're waiting, both of us, we're here. Yeah. Wow. And so what do you, I mean, what and do, do they always someone... figure it out? Are you always able to help no, somebody? No, mm-hmm. not always. No. Yeah. I mean, most people come to a place of peace, but not everybody. No. Yeah. Not a, and I guess that's why it's important, like, don't start while you're dying. Like, start now. I mean, I really mean that. I, like, the book is called On Living because it's not about dying. No, it's it's but, about living and making sense of things. And, and yeah. again, this is, uh, like you say, it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody at hospice. And, and I would also add to that, when you have these many stories from people who work at hospice, with hospice, pay, all of this, and you hear these stories over and over again, how can they not be so? <laughs> it does not make sense. <laughs> I mean, you know, and so that to me is very comforting, and so that's all that that matters. But this is a book for, for the living, and it is 
who better to teach us, you know, than somebody who is sharing their life stories and sharing them with, with and I'm on the phone with Carrie Egan, she's a hospice chaplain, and these stories are, so many of them are just so chilling and there's such a connection we clean up now we clean up while we can clean up and and then yeah. have, you know live with as little regret as possible and i think that's the thing it's a book for everybody everybody it is just gorgeous it's on living carrie mm-hmm. egan it's out Thank by you. riverhead and again follow her on twitter find her on facebook and she'll be updating that website of hers <laughs> carrie egan.com <laughs> but it's great it's wonderful and Look for her big NPR interview out with Terry Gross soon. You can hear that, and you can see the wonderful People magazine. I don't even know if we talked about that. I was all over Facebook. I was so excited. Huge <laughs> review in People magazine. I mean. Because let's be honest. I mean, that's I get huge. a lot of my book ideas from People magazine. Like, you I, know. My first, when I, I don't get it anymore, I used to subscribe, and I got it for years. But when I pick up people, that's where I go to see. And I already know the books, of course, because I get them ahead. But I'm always so excited to see books that I love in people because it is huge. And when I saw On Living in People magazine, you know, well, you saw I posted all about it. And you can find that on Reading with Robin. You can go to my site, readingwithrobin.com, or find it on uh, Facebook, the Reading with Robin page, where I was posting all about On Living. And I will continue to. This is a book for everybody, and I wish you all the best with it and look forward to seeing you. I'm sure you'll be up here in, in New England soon enough, and we're old friends as it is. So I know. I can't wait to meet you in person. I know. I'm so <laughs> excited and all really excited about this, and I'll be sharing it, and you can um, like the Facebook page, Carrie Egan's Facebook page, and keep up with everything and continued success and all the best. And Thank you for your to your children for letting me have you for to <laughs> <laughs> sit some kind of record pre and post. Well, they they, they were they were interrupting there for a little while, but that's right. <laughs> you know, it, it's a family <laughs> show. It's all good. Yeah, that's what it's all. That's good, kids. It's all it's all about it. So thank you very much, Carrie. All the best. Thank you so much for having me. Really, thank you.